In this video, we continue our exploration of AC circuits by investigating the power issues going on in the RLC series circuit. And we derive formulas for the instantaneous and average power and define the power factor, which tells us how power depends on the phase angle between the net voltage function and the current function. So on the left side of our animation, we have the current and voltage phasers for the RLC series circuit. And on the right, we're seeing how the instantaneous power function results from the product of the current and voltage functions for the circuit. And one interesting feature of this power function is that it's oscillating twice as fast as the original sinusoidal functions. The other interesting feature is that the power function can actually go negative, meaning the energy is actually flowing back into the source momentarily, even though our average power is positive, meaning that it flows from the source to the circuit. And we'll get into all the gory details of the math in a minute, but first we need to do a really quick review of what we know about the RLC circuit and how we know it. So in our main RLC video, we did the full derivation of the voltage as a function of time for an RLC series circuit, and we did this by applying Kirchhoff's voltage law to the circuit. So we said the sum of the voltage changes on a closed loop is zero, or the voltage across the source is equal to the sum of the voltage drops across the individual circuit elements. Now using a reference phase of zero for the current function, we subbed in the sinusoidal functions that we had figured out previously for the voltage across each circuit element with phase angles measured relative to the zero phase of the current function. So there's the resistor voltage function, in phase with the current function and having an amplitude of i times r and there's the inductor voltage function leading the current function by a phase angle of pi over 2 and having an amplitude of ixl where xl is called the inductive reactance and that's given by omega times l and finally there's the capacitor voltage function lagging the current function by a phase angle of pi over 2 and having an amplitude of ixc where Xc is called the capacitive reactance, and that's given by one over omega C. And if you missed it, I've been posting links to all those individual derivations up there at the top of your screen. So then to get the total voltage or source voltage here, we had to add these three sinusoidal functions that have differing phase angles. And this is where the phasor representation of these sinusoidal functions came into play. To add a bunch of cosine functions with the same frequency but different phase angles, we represent them as rotating vectors or phasors whose horizontal components correspond to the cosine functions that we're adding. So there's the phasor diagram for our resistor, inductor, and capacitor for some arbitrary moment in time t with an angle of omega t for the current function and the resistor voltage phasor. Remember, the resistor voltage is in phase with the current function. And there's the horizontal components of these guys. And those are just the original voltage functions that we wanted to add. So what we showed is that we can just take a vector sum of these phasors and then take the horizontal component of that vector sum. And that gives us a single phase shifted cosine for the net voltage across this RLC circuit. In other words, the phasor representation is a powerful geometric trick for adding a bunch of sinusoidal functions that have different phases. And the vector sum wasn't that hard to compute because all our relative angles are pi over 2 here. So we started the vector sum by picking up the capacitor voltage phasor and attaching it to the head of the inductor voltage phasor. So there's that. And then drawing a vector from the tail of the first to the head of the second. That gives us a net component perpendicular to the current phasor with a magnitude of IXL minus IXC. Then we slid that vector over to the tip of the resistor voltage phasor. And our net voltage phasor points from the tail of the first to the head of the last. And there it is. So we called the magnitude of that guy big V and the phase angle relative to the current phasor is phi. And remember, the actual sinusoidal voltage function is given by the horizontal component of that phasor. So that's big V cosine omega t plus phi. So then we use the Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude of the net voltage phasor. And I just took the liberty of factoring out an i there, and we get i times the square root of r squared plus the quantity xl minus xc all squared. And then we defined that square root as the total impedance of the circuit. And we use a capital Z for the impedance. So this gives us an Ohm's law style relation between the voltage and current amplitudes. And that's just V equals iz. So Z is acting as the total effective resistance there. 
But remember, Z is frequency dependent because the inductive and capacitive reactances are both frequency dependent. So next, we use the inverse tangent to find the phase angle relative to the current phaser, or equivalently the resistor phaser. So our phase angle phi is the inverse tangent of XL minus XC over R, just looking at the legs of the right triangle in the picture there. And our source voltage across this circuit can be written as little v of t is big I big Z cosine omega t plus phi, where phi is the phase angle between the current function and the voltage function. So that's our quick RLC series circuit review. And now it's time to calculate the total power delivered to this circuit by the source. So notice that we've stripped the phaser diagram down to just the current and net voltage phasers here. And to compute the total instantaneous power delivered to this circuit, we do the same old thing we've always done. Power equals current times voltage. So now we just have to sub in the formulas for these two sinusoidal functions. So the current function was I cosine omega t, the voltage function was I z cosine omega t plus phi. We just gather the constants out in front and we get I squared z cosine omega t cosine omega t plus phi, where phi is again the phase angle between the net voltage and the current phasers for the circuit. Now before we move on to time averaging this power function, I want to illustrate what it actually looks like because it has a couple surprising features. First, the period of oscillation of the power function is actually half as long as the original sinusoidal functions. So in the animation, we see the power function resulting from the product of current and voltage functions at each moment in time. And we can see that the instantaneous power function has a period half as long as the original sinusoids. And here's a second point that's a little surprising. We see the power function actually dip below the T axis momentarily. And this means the direction of energy flow has been reversed. Instead of energy flowing from the source to the circuit, we briefly get energy flowing from the circuit to the source. And this is possible because remember, the capacitor and inductor are capable of storing and then releasing energy. So if you look carefully at the graphs of these sinusoidal functions, you can see that this reversed power flow occurs when the current is positive while the voltage is negative and vice versa. So we see the voltage change signs right here before the current catches up and changing signs right here. And it's that brief in-between interval caused by the phase angle on the voltage that gives us this moment of reversed power flow. Now, the next thing we want to do is time average this power function. So we're going to compute an average value integral. So remember, that's the integral of the function over an integer number of periods, then divided by the interval width. And I like to do these integrals from 0 to 2 pi over omega. That's the period of the original sinusoidal functions. But as we can see from the shaded area here, this is actually an average over two periods of the power function because of the power function's faster period. But that's fine because the average over any integer number of periods is going to be the same number. So let's plug in the details on this average value integral. So we pull the i squared z out in front. And there's our expression for average power. We have to integrate a product of two cosines with the same frequency but different phase shifts in there. So let's just clear out some space to get this done. And the way to make progress on this is to apply our identity for the cosine of a sum. Remember, the cosine of x plus y is cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. So I want to apply this to that cosine omega t plus phi in the integral. So expanding that cosine of a sum, here's what our integral looks like. We have one term with two cosines in it in those brackets, one term with two sines in it in those brackets. So let's just distribute that cosine omega t and clean things up a little bit. And this first piece is just a classic trigonometric integral. It's essentially just the integral of cosine squared. And we'll get back to that one in just a second. First, I want to take a look at this part. So remember that sine phi is just a constant out in front. And really what we're looking at here is a product of a sine and a cosine. We have a cosine omega t sine omega t. But we recognize that as part of another trig identity. Remember the sine of 2x is 2 sine x cosine x. So whenever you see a product of a sine and a cosine, you can turn it back into a sine with twice the argument. In other words, this term we're looking at is proportional to the sine of 2 omega t. But that's just a simple sinusoidal function with a midline of zero and a period of pi over omega. And we're integrating over two full periods of this guy, and that's going to give us zero by symmetry. 
So we don't even have to integrate that term to see that it's going to be zero. That part is gone. And now we can get back to the cosine squared term. And remember the cosine phi is just a constant out in front. And essentially we're just integrating cosine squared here. And the standard plan of attack on that is to use this identity that cosine squared x is one half times the quantity one plus cosine two x. So we're going to make that replacement. And I went ahead and pulled out the factor of one half from the identity out in front and we pulled out the constant cosine of phi. So now we're just integrating one plus cosine two omega t from zero to two pi over omega. Now we can make the same periodicity argument that we made for the sine of two omega t just a second ago. If I take the cosine of two omega t and I integrate that over an integer number of periods, I've got to get zero by symmetry. And that's exactly what we're doing here, integrating over two periods of that function. So that term is gone. This leaves us with the simple integral of one dt. Now the antiderivative is just t, and when we evaluate across the limits of integration, that integral produces a two pi over omega, and that's it. So we make that replacement. The value of the integral is just two pi over omega, and now we can cancel the two pi over omegas. And this average power integral cleans up to one half i squared z cosine phi. So there's our result for the average power into an RLC circuit we get one half i squared z cosine phi, but we could also express the result without the impedance in it by just recognizing that i times z is the voltage amplitude here. So we could also write it as one half i v cosine phi, or we could express it without the i in it by replacing i with v over z. And that gives us one half v squared over z cosine phi. Now, the next thing we might wanna do here is re-express our answer in terms of the RMS current and voltage. And recall that the relationship between amplitude and RMS value is just a factor of square root two. And I'll post a link to that derivation up at the top. So we could replace our current amplitude I with just square root two times I RMS or the voltage amplitude with square root two times V RMS. So we can just modify all three of our formulas for average power in terms of these RMS values. So replacing big I with square root two I RMS. So we're making that replacement up here. We end up squaring that big I, which gives us a factor of two because we're squaring a factor of square root two. So then those twos are going to cancel and our formula cleans up a little bit to I squared RMS Z times cosine phi. And the other formulas are similar. Each one of them gets two factors of square root two when we re-express it in terms of RMS values and it cleans up that factor of one half out in front. So our second formula becomes IRMS VRMS cosine phi and our final formula becomes VRMS squared over Z cosine phi. Now one cool thing about our result for the average power is that the average power has a simple dependency on phase angle. Well, remember that phi is the angle between the net voltage phasor and the current phasor. So that cosine phi part of our average power formula gets a special name, and that's called the power factor for the circuit. And remember, this thing is frequency dependent because we compute phi as the inverse tangent of XL minus XC over R, where the inductive and capacitive reactances are omega L for the inductive reactants and one over omega C for the capacitive reactants. So the average power delivered to this circuit depends on the frequency that we drive it at. And as you might guess, sometimes we're interested in maximizing the power delivered to the circuit. So this happens at phi equals zero, just because that gives us the maximum value of the cosine function, which in turn means the inductive and capacitive reactances must be equal to each other. And all I did there is look in that inverse tangent function and ask myself what could make this zero and it's if the numerator is zero there. So we have the inductive and capacitive reactances equal at the maximum average power. And it's not hard to find the special frequency at which this occurs. We sub in the formulas for inductive and capacitive reactants. So that gives us omega L equals one over omega C. And then we multiply both sides by omega, divide both sides by L and square root the result. And that gives us omega equals one over the square root of L C. And notice that I put a little subscript of R on that special frequency because that's actually called the resonant frequency for the circuit. Now the next video is entirely dedicated to the exploration of resonance in an LRC circuit. And we approach the problem from a slightly different perspective that resonance occurs when we maximize the current amplitude. But we just saw one consequence of maximizing the current amplitude. The power is maximized at this special frequency as well.
And there's so much more to say about resonance in this circuit. And I'll post a link to that big RLC resonance video at the upper left, and I'll see you there.